found in this study. Um, so first of all, we found in terms of performance, the expert control group in terms of number of hits was better than the injury group, which is better than the analysis. Not surprising. Um, but the attention is where the real interesting thing is. Okay? So let's look at the, here's the, the number of correct responses they make in those different judgments um, for the three different tasks. Okay? This is when they're judging about the arm. Okay? And this is a typical pattern we see when we ask experts and novices to make judgments about their body while they're acting. What you can see is the novices are way better at it. They get a higher percent correct. The two experts, whether they're injured or not, are about the same, they're worse, significantly worse. This is the arm, this wasn't what was injured. Now look at the leg, right? We get a big difference here. The, the expert control group is still relatively poor at it, but now the, the injured experts are acting like novices, okay? They're focusing on their leg. What they're not focusing on is the ball leaving the bat, okay? The expert control group is really good at judging that, the novice and the other two are there, okay? So we seem to get this, this after effect of this in, in injury, injury where the tension is turned inwards, okay, focusing on the body. And bringing that around to the variability, what, now what I'm going, doing, back, doing is going back and analyzing the swing, doing the same type of uncontrolled manifold analysis. What I'm seeing is a really interesting pattern. The expert control group looks like the training group from the other study I showed after six weeks. Okay? Good more good uh, variability along the manifold. The ACE injured group is getting a really awful looking pattern where they seem to be imposing some restriction on their movement, right? Um, and it, it, it kind of makes sense, right? This, part of this is a wind-up, which, which is a big leg kick with your injured knee. And it's going to cause a lot of force to come down on your knee, right? So it's not surprising maybe that they're doing this. So, so this is really, really new stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll keep you posted about it, how this turns out. But it seems like you can also do this to pick out this functional variable. Um, the last thing, very last thing I want to talk about is, uh, as I said, something I don't have a good answer for, but I think it's an important question is, when should we be encouraging high variability? If we want our athletes to explore and go through all these different conditions and post constraints and all these things, when should we do it? Well, I think we should start thinking about uh, doing it in terms of a, a kind of a periodization method, right? If we kind of plot our season out, and we're in the off season, right? We're not close to competition. That's the time when the goal of practice should really be learning, right? And learning is messy, right? You should look back, right? What we want is a lot of variability. We want a lot of randomness and conditions. We maybe we want to add a lot of constraints and get people used to pressure, use overloaded equipment, okay? And the phrase that some people use is comfortable chaos, right? We want to make it really tough on them, but not too tough, obviously. Okay? But as we move towards kind of um, getting towards closer to competition, maybe we should start thinking about the goal of practice as performance, right? Looking good in practice, feeling confident, um, being able to produce the same movement and execute it well. And this is probably where we want to reduce that practice variability down, focus on uh, you know, getting people confident and self-efficacy, uh, make sure we're really task specific as well. Okay, so I think you know this is a kind of periodization of skill acquisition is I think going to be a really interesting topic um, for people to explore. But I, I think that's a, kind of a, what my general thinking of it is, and I hope to do some more on that later on. Um, so to kind of sum up, kind of more broad conclusions, research type conclusions. Um, the, I think the the role of movement variability in motor learning it really depends on a lot of factors. Okay. There's growing evidence of this for this good variability when you're varying things that are don't directly affect the skill but allow for this adaptability. But we have a lot more work to do to try to figure out exactly what that is and when it occurs. Okay. Um, hopefully, you see that the amount of variability, movement variability you get in your athlete is strongly linked to your practice design. So you need to be a, a good practice designer. And we get this kind of dysfunctional uh, relationship when you, with injury and anxiety. And then finally for coaches, okay, so going back to that, 
that one study I talked about by uh, Tim and Damien, um, I really consider, you know, even if you're, you're not going to use a lot of variability, consider quantifying it at least, and then you can start seeing how it relates to your practice outcomes. And I said, check out that paper, it gives you uh, good metrics, okay? One of the things that I really like to encourage coaches is when you're observing and watching your athletes, be very deliberate and intentful about what you're looking for, right? What I, what I actually like the phrase, I like to use the term tracking athletes rather than watching them. You should have in your mind what you want to see, right? What specific thing. If you don't see it, then like Sean was doing, step in. Everything else though, let it be, right? Don't just chase random variations in what your athlete is doing, right? Think about what you want to, to step in with, okay? And, you know, I'd encourage you to continuously challenge some of the absolutes that movement has to have this form or it has to be this way. There's some things like that, um, but, you know, I continue to look at, often when we look at skilled athletes, you, you look at a group of skilled athletes, you look for what's similar, right? You try to say, what, what makes all these baseball players good? Try looking for what's different, right? And you'll see there's more ways to do things than, than you probably thought. And I guess the, the last thing I'll say, I didn't put this point here, but I was talking about it earlier. If you're going to introduce this variability of practice, okay, not only do I think you want to make it kind of uh, periodize it part, probably, you also need to think about it proportionally. You want to make it relative to both the nature of your sport and the level of your athletes. For example, when we're talking NFL players, they work in an unbelievably variable environment. Every time they're running with the ball, it's different, right? So we need high variability in the game needs high variability in practice. If you're talking about a sprinter coming out of the blocks, there's some variability there, but it's much, much slower. So you probably don't need as much. And then also with lower level athletes, you probably don't need as much variability. And then I'll end with my shameless promotion slide. Of, there's my Twitter. I'm guessing a lot of people here, most people here know, uh, but if you don't, I have a podcast called the Perception Action Podcast where I talk about all this kind of stuff and I can interview a few of the people in this room and I'll probably I'll, I'll hit up more of you in the coming weeks. So thank you very much.